Alrighty, so functions. Yesterday we learned that function notation is another way to write equations for mathematical relationships. Um, and now the reason that is, is because every input into a function gives back exactly one output, okay? And it's important that it says exactly one output. Exactly one output, okay? So let's kind of explore this further by looking at the situation that's kind of shown at the bottom of the screen. Um, we have a table that's filled out, but we have an empty box for a list of coordinates, an empty graph, and an empty mapping, which I'll explain what that is in just a second. So let's, for now, let's just take this table and turn it into a graph. Okay, so zero, negative one. Here's the point. Zero, positive one. There's our point. Two, two. There's our point. Three, four. And four, zero. One, two, three, four, zero. Okay, there's our points on a graph. So now let's do a list of coordinates. That's what goes in this blank box right here. It should have a title. List of coordinates. So my first one is zero, negative one. My next coordinate is zero, positive one. Two, two. Three, four. And four, zero. All right. Remember those little squiggly brackets are used for a domain and range because that is a list. Same thing here. This is still a list. It's just a list of points this time. Okay. So we have the points written out. We have the graph. We have the table. Um, we want to know if this is a function. Before we do that, can we go ahead and do the domain and range? I feel like we can. So domain, again, is just the list of the x's. Zero, I'm only going to write once because we only need to write it once. Range is the list of the y's. We write them in order from least to greatest. Okay, there we go. I feel better. Yeah, let's go ahead and do a mapping too. So mapping is actually, this would be something that's new. It's not a big deal at all. There's two bubbles. The left bubble is where you put all of your X's or your domain. Right bubble is where you put all your Y's or your range. I say domain and range because you really only list things once like you do for domain and range. So for the X's, I've got zero, two, three, and four. My range, I've got negative one, zero, one, two, and four. The cool thing about a mapping is that it allows you to um, show what from the domain goes with what from the range. We talked the other day about how if I were to just give you a domain and range and nothing else, you would have no idea what the coordinates are because it's not matched up. You don't know which value in the domain goes with what. So the mapping takes the domain and range and then draws arrows, so for example, 0 to negative 1, to show you what your coordinates are. So my first value in the table excuse me, was 0, negative 1, so I drew that uh, arrow. The next one on my table is 0, positive 1, so I'm going to draw an arrow from 0 to positive 1. Next one is 2, 2, so an arrow from 2 to 2, 3, 4, and then back up here, 4, 0. Okay, so mapping is just a visual representation of the domain and the range with arrows connecting them to show what your actual coordinates are. Okay, now that we have everything filled out except for the actual question, let's talk about the definition one more time. Functions, um, the, the definition function is every input gives back exactly one output. Okay, so input. What do I mean by input? Obviously, I mean x's, right? Every x gives back only one y, okay? So let's just play a little game here. If I say the input is 4, what's the output? Y'all would say 0. If I say what's the, the output if my input is 3? You would say 4. But now, if I say my input is 0, what does your answer become? This one is harder to tell because we have two answers here, right? We have negative 1 and 1 as potential answers. We don't want that. Okay, that right there is what tells me this is not a function, okay, because the input of zero gives me two outputs. I feel like this is easiest to see in the mapping, okay. I can see right here that Mr. Zero here has a line going to negative one and a line going to positive one. I kind of think about this like phone calls and relationships, right. A functional relationship would be where one mister is only calling one lady, right. So right here, I've got Mr. Zero, and he is calling negative one, and he's calling positive one, which is not cool, right? He needs to just pick one and stick with it, okay? So um, that's one way to think about what a function is, right? We need our exes, our, our gentlemen over here, to just be making one phone call, all righty? So let's extend this a little bit further. Let's look at another example. This time, they gave us the list of coordinates, so we're going to need to turn them into a table, graph, and mapping. So I'm just going to start writing them in. 2, 5, 3, negative 2, 4, 3, 5, 1, 6, 3. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and put them on my graph. 2, 5. 
three, negative two, nineteen, four, three, and three quarter, three, five, one, and six, three. Okay, cool. My mapping really would be easier to do if I've already done my domain and raid, so I'm going to go ahead and start there. Domain is my list of all my x's. Range is the list of y's, but they're from least to greatest. I'm actually going to use my graph to find my range and go across my graph from bottom to top. So the first one I come to is that negative 2 sitting there. Then 1, 3, and 4. No, 5. Sorry. Five. Can't count. Five. Okay. Now I can move that down into my mapping. 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Negative 2, 1, 3, 5. Now, like we learned before, mapping is what shows those phone calls. Shows who's connected to who. So I'm going to go back to my table for this. 2 needs to be connected with 5. Okay, cool. 2 to 5. 3 needs to be with negative 2. 4 needs to be with 3. 5 with 1. And 6 with 3. Okay. So by the definition, every input has exactly one output. Let me look at my mapping here. Is Mr. 2 here calling only one lady? Sure is. He's only calling 5. 3, only calling negative 2. We're good there. 4 is only calling 1. 5 is only calling 1. 6 is only calling 1. So good. Everybody is calling one person. That means, yes, this is a function. Now, some of you may be looking at this thinking, whoa, whoa, whoa wait a minute. Miss 3 over here has two phone calls coming in, right? She is being called by 4 and 6. All righty. Now, that's okay. In the world of math, that is okay. I like to think about this about like the, the olden times when the guys had to court the girls. It is not Miss Three's fault that she has two boys interested in her, right? Now, eventually, she should probably make a call and just go with one. But for now, it is not her fault that two people are following her. Think about it like at the prom. If it's just a big madhouse of call somebody, invite them to prom. If she gets two invites, you know, she should pick one, but it's not her fault that she got two invites, okay? So this is still a function. What we really care about is that our X's are only calling one person. Our X's are only matched with one person, okay? So before we move on, let's kind of look back at each representation. I'm going to go back to the problem before, actually. Where do I see in my table that this is not a function? Where do I see that this is bad? Well, I see that it's bad because I've got two zeros here. It shows me that they're matched up incorrectly, okay? Where do I see it in my graph? Well, I see it right here. I've got two points on the zero line, right? This zero vertical line, that's my, my, my x equals zero line. It's got two points on it. That's not okay. Where do I see my mapping? I already have that in red right here. He's making two phone calls. Okay? So I can tell that it's bad in all three places. My table shows it by listing them twice. My graph shows it by putting them on the same vertical line. My mapping shows it by having two arrows coming out of the same point. Alrighty? So now let's look at the, the example that is a function. How do I know this is okay? Well, looking at my x's here, Nothing's written twice. Nothing had to be written twice because they're only calling one person, so that's okay. If you see the same Y written twice, that's all right. It is okay that the Y is on there twice, as long as every X is only written once. Okay, let's look at the graph. I see that like this two line right here, there's only one point on it. That's good. This three line, there's only this one point on it. That's good. Four, we're good. Five, we're good. Six, we're good. Notice, these are on the same horizontal line, but that's okay. That's all right, okay? Looking at the mapping, again, I see only one phone call coming out of each one of these X values, and that is what we want. As long as there's one arrow coming out, we're good. Two arrows coming in here on the three, that's all right. We are okay with that, okay? So now let's do um, some graphs that don't really have multiple representations. Um, in your notes, you have a part about the situation cards. We're gonna save that for later, so just skip over that for now, and let's talk about the vertical line test. Just a second ago on these last two examples, um, when you're looking at a graph, if it's a function, each vertical line, which represents an x value, should only have one point on it. That is essentially the vertical line test, okay? So um, I'm gonna say using a vertical line, which a lot of times can just be your pen, your pencil, your finger, honestly, using a vertical line, move across the graph, And check to see if it is hitting or 
running out of room here. Hitting the vertical line. In more than one place. If it is, that's bad. Okay. So, I'll explain this better with these, these um, pictures down here. So, number three, for example. Picture that I have a vertical line. You know what? I bet there is some sort of fancy pants tool like a ruler I could use. Let's see here. Let's see. Oh, yes. Let's see if I can rotate it. Can I rotate it? Probably should not be trying things in my video, huh? Should just have it all ready to go. Bummer. Okay, now how do I get rid of it? That hurt. Okay. Oh, no, no, I'm making multiple. Videos. Okay, well, I'm just going to have to leave these down here. Y'all can be laughing secret secretly at my, my technology knowledge here. Okay, anyways, pretend that, there, oh, pretend that there's a vertical line that we are moving across this graph, okay? Pretend that this is a pen. When I start moving it this direction, okay, and I start moving it across this graph, you'll see that it is always touching that vertical line in two places, right? For example, here and here, it's touching the vertical line. Here and here, it's touching the vertical line. That is not okay. That makes this not a function. Okay, this is a no. Okay, so let's go to the next one. Same thing. If I had a vertical line, like my pen or something, and I started moving it across the graph, I notice it is touching here and here, here and here. Not okay. But now let's look at um, this last one. I'm going to come back to five. If I have a vertical line and I start moving it across my graph, okay, you'll notice it's only hitting it here here, here, it's never hitting that vertical line more than once at a time. So this one is a function. This one's good, okay? If I go back to these first two, three and four, this kind of shows you who your, who your uh, Mr. X's are that, are that are not being so nice, okay? For example, right here, this line. That is, let's see, what is that number? One, two, three, four. Mr. Four here, he is calling this one and this one, right? Or like right here on this line. It's hard to get it right on there. That's like Mr. Six. He's calling this person and this person. Not okay. Alrighty. So if I go back to this number six, right? This line right here, negative five that I was on before, he's only calling the person at that dot. He's not calling two people. Okay, so let's look at five. Again, vertical line. I'm good, I'm good, I'm good, I'm good. When I get over here, though, that line that's there is literally touching the line in every single place. This is that guy who calls every single girl trying to get a date to the prom. Not okay, he needs to pick one. So this is definitely not a function. Not by any means is this a function because he is calling everybody. Alrighty. Oh man, domain and range. I'm a little, look, that's what I wanted. Now it's too late. Now I know for future. Okay, so domain and range, I just wanted to throw those in there as a little bit of extra practice. I'm actually gonna pause the video and do these really fast, and then I'll unpause it. Feel free to do those, um, pause the video yourself and do those, and then check to see if we get the same. Alrighty, so check with what I have there. Make sure that you've got the same things I did. Um, if you need any sort of review on domain and range, make sure you come check in with me before after school so I can catch you up to speed there. Alrighty, so from here on out, it is really just a whole bunch of practicing, okay? Here's two more examples I'll do with you, and then we've got some um, lists of coordinates to go through, some tables, but it's really the same thing over and over. So again, is this a function? Yes, it is, because there's no vertical line that has more than one point on it, okay? Notice, there is definitely some horizontal lines that have more than one point, like here and here, but that's allowed, okay? Um, domain here, remember you would list out the points, same with the range. I'm not going to do it for time's sake, but you could definitely do that. We'll check back later. Number eight, is it a function? Well, my first vertical line I draw, I've got two points on it, right here and right here. So this is a big fat no. Okay. Domain, same thing. This is discrete, so you list the points. Same with the range. Here's some more examples. Just says determine which ones are functions. If it's not, circle two ordered pairs that show the same x value with two different y values. This will go very quickly. Um, I'm going to start working through them, but at any point, if you feel like you understand what's going on, feel free to pause it and then replay it to see if you got them correctly. I do want you to try to try these on your own before you just rely on me answering everything for you. So, here's your opportunity to pause. Okay, and number nine, this is not a function because five and three 
5 and negative 4. Mr. 5 here is cheating. He is with negative 4 and 3. Not okay. Number 10. This one's good because none of these x's are cheating. We're good here. We do have negative 7, negative 7, negative 3, negative 2, but that's allowed. That's okay. Number 11. Not a function. I've got 0 and 0. Not okay. Number 12 here. It's just a list of coordinates. This is not a function because I've got negative 5 here with negative 5. Not okay. Number 13, I'll have to look closely here. Um, let's see. I'm pretty sure this is a function. Negative 8 is only listed once. 5 is only listed once. 4, 2, yeah, that one looks good. 14, again, it's kind of hard to have a lot of points here. So I'm looking at my x's. 12, we're good. 4 is okay. 7 is okay. 8, 11, 5. We're good there. That one's a function. Here's a few more examples. Number 15, which one does not represent a function? So again, I'm looking for that x being repeated, being listed with two different y's. B would be my answer. We've got 4 with 2 and 4 with 5 over here. Not okay. Okay, 16 has some mappings. So this one is extending your knowledge of mapping. We want to know which one represents a function, since there may be more than one answer. So a is not a function, right? Who's cheating? Mr. Negative 4 here. He is making two phone calls. That is not allowed. Okay. B, is this a function? Yes, it is. This one's good. Okay, this would be one of our answers because every input has exactly one output. Okay, nobody here is cheating. C, is this a function? Yes, it is. This is my other answer. Okay, negative 4 only has 1, negative 3 only has 1, negative 2 only has 1, and negative 1 only has 1. Yes, the 0 has two arrows coming into it, but that's okay. She cannot help it if she gets two phone calls. Right? A few more things. This one's kind of a, an interesting problem. Helps you think outside the box a little bit. The members of the Miller family are Sally, the mother, James, the father, Jenna, Janice, and Joy, the daughters, and Sam, the son. So let's consider the relation that is the set of all x, y, such that x is the brother of y. That's a bunch of fancy talk for just saying, write the points where x is the brother of y. Well, the only brother we have is Sam. So Sam is the brother of Jenna. Kind of looks like Jimna, sorry. Sam is the brother of Janice, and Sam is the brother of Joy, okay? So we have three ordered pairs in this set. What is the domain? Well, it's a list of the x's, so I've got Sam, oh, he's the only one. The range, that's the list of y's, so that's Jenna, Janice, and Joy, okay? Now it says, is this a function? So again, does every input have exactly one output? The answer here is no, okay? The input of Sam has three outputs. And if this is kind of hard for you to picture, picture a mapping again, okay? If we have our two bubbles here, and we've got Sam on this side, he's gonna be calling all three of his sisters. That's not allowed, right? And that's weird, I mean, it's kind of sad. If he has to take his sisters to prom, I feel sad for him. But we don't want that. We want every input to only have one output. Alrighty. Last thing is this situation here. We'll just work through it. It kind of combines all the things we've learned about. We have this equation, P equals 4T minus 200. It's about the student count's dance, the number of tickets that are available for sale, and the profit that they may, might earn. Okay? So it's interesting to note that they're going to start down here at negative 200. Right? So at zero tickets sold, they are down $200. Okay? That's because maybe they bought supplies, they bought food, um, who knows, but they are down $200. So the next point that I notice is this one right here. At, it's hard to tell, 50, they break even. So if they sell 50 tickets, they have $0. But at least they're not in debt, right? Okay, 100 tickets, they have made, is that 100? No, $200. Okay, so that's good. Next one I see is 150 tickets in which they've made $400, okay? Now, even though those numbers are pretty hard to see, the other way I could have gotten these numbers is by using my equation to work this out, right? If I plug in each of these numbers, I should get out each of these numbers, okay? So complete the table, check, I did that. Oh, this is tickets, this is profit, okay? So this is what is the domain of the situation? Well, the domain is the list of the x's. Now. While we could say 0, 50, 100, et cetera, really, they could sell one ticket. They could sell two tickets, et cetera, right? 
So what I think I want to say is this. I'm going to write it first. Okay, so I said the domain is from 0 to infinity, but I said whole numbers only because they're not going to sell half of a ticket, right? They also can't sell negative tickets, and there also shouldn't be a limit technically. Now, if we knew how many kids were in the school, that might put a limit on the, on the top end, but for the most part, they could sell as many as they want, right? Okay, ring. This is going to be a similar story, except that we know that when they sell zero tickets, they're actually starting at negative $200. Okay, so that is going to be my lower end there, and it goes, again, up to infinity. Okay, now we don't know exactly the details of this situation, so I'm not going to put whole numbers only, because um, technically we can have decimal numbers for money, right? You know, $4.50, something like that, although they did tell us it would be $4 per ticket. Um, but I'm just going to leave it like that. I'm not going to put any constraints on that yet. So now D, it says, suppose 300 tickets had been sold, how much profit would they make? So let's use our equation, right? We said the equation was 4P, no, 4T, sorry, 4P, 4T, 4T minus 200, and that equaled our profit. So if they sold 300 tickets, that means I'm going to do 4 times 300 minus 200. So that's 1,200 minus 200 is $1,000. Okay, you could also look at the graph and just see kind of approximately where it's going to be. All right, part E, does this represent a function? Explain. Well, yes, because every time a different number of tickets is bought, a different number for their profit is going to come out, right? We would not say, what's your profit with 10 tickets? And they say, oh, $500 and $200. That doesn't make sense, right? There's just a number. There's one answer. So yes, this is a function. You can also tell by using the vertical line test. Moving your vertical line across the graph, you can see that it's only ever going to touch the graph in one place. If they wanted to make $1,400 in profit, how many tickets must they sell? That's working backwards. So $1,400 is equal to 4P minus 200. Then add 200, 1,600 to be 400 tickets. Alrighty. Okay, I feel like that is it. Let me keep going. Yeah, that's it. So make sure that you practice this. This is something that can be practiced very quickly. Actually, doesn't take that much time. So make sure you practice and you really understand um, what makes a function and what doesn't. Make sure you understand the vertical line test. And let me know if you have any questions. I would be happy to help you.